a special interview with Bill Gottemoller of Versailles, Ohio, an NFO member, a cattle feeder, a national plowing champion, and a visit with Bob Manke, who is the director of the feeder cattle division of NFO, on today's U.S. Farm Report. So stay tuned. Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. Yes, on today's show, as a part of our recent U.S. Farm Report field trip tour, we will take you to the farm of Bill Gottemoller in Versailles, Ohio, a fine young man, national plowing champion, a member of NFO, president of NFO in his county, and an outstanding cattle feeder. In our studio, as a part of today's show, we welcome back once again Mr. Bob Manke. Bob is no stranger to U.S. Farm Report. He is the director of the feeder cattle division of the National Farmers Organization. Bob, it's a pleasure to welcome you back. Thank you, Bill. Now, let me ask you this. I have heard or read that about 1% of uh, the feedlots around the country control around 60% of the fat cattle. Now, this being true, where are these feedlots concentrated? Well, the main feedlots and the largest ones are in Colorado, Texas, California, Nebraska, and it's mainly the heavy grain producing areas where these feedlots are concentrated. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to mention on this, Bill, it's very difficult to pinpoint that this is true because the feedlots are normally listed at a thousand head or over, but these are the best estimates that we can get from people that are very knowledgeable and with what we found out in the cattle feeding industry. Mm -hmm. Bob, where does Bill Gottemoller, who lives in Ohio, go for his feeder cattle? Well, normally, and this is uh, uh, something that's happened in the past, the people in Ohio and Indiana their large supply of feeder cattle come from Kentucky and Tennessee. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's happening now is that the large feedlots are beginning to come into these areas and buy large amounts of feeder cattle, and it's beginning to get more and more difficult for these people to get their supply of feeder cattle. One of the things that we feel quite confident of, Bill, and this is uh, uh, quite serious, that the capacity of the large feedlots at the present time is capable of feeding out all the cattle in the United States with no independent feeders taking, uh, having any cattle at all. Mm -hmm. And that's how dangerous it's getting. The southeastern part of the country then is most significant in feeder cattle numbers, right? Yes, one of the interesting things here that you'll note is that Mississippi has 1,235,000 cows while Montana here only has 1,555,000. Mm -hmm. And with this taking place, uh, Mississippi is going to have some of the, uh, possibly, the largest uh, free supply of feeder cattle available in the United States. And all of the southeast, including Arkansas and Louisiana, Kentucky and Tennessee and Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, these states are all nearing the million uh, cow mark, million head of cows in each state, mm -hmm. and this is a large supply of uncommitted feeder cattle. I think it doesn't hurt at all to repeat, Bob, if you will, the many advantages to the cattle feeder in buying his feeder cattle through NFO. Well, this is one of the important parts of our program, Bill. We've had uh, seeing that this is our second year of our feeder program, we've had a lot of repeat orders. And uh, just to give you an example of what one uh, feeder told us, 
that he said when he bought them these cattle that they were two dollars too high. He kept the records for 30 days. And after showing us the records between the cattle that he bought from us and cattle that he purchased in, uh, through uh, another source, he said our cattle were two dollars cheaper at that mm -hmm. time, 30 days later. But the uh, benefits that we can give to the feeder are really four, uh, four of them. One of them that we get ranch fresh cattle into the feedlot. And if we can work it right down to the amount of hours that we normally have the cattle in our gathering or collection points is that maximum, four hours. The charges for the services of the assignee and and the NFO are known both to the buyer and the seller. And the identity of the cattle are maintained. The feeder knows who these cattle came from, the price paid for each draft of cattle. And the shipping time and the stress is kept to a minimum on these cattle. There's no dealer cattle or anything allowed in our NFO mm -hmm. uh, gathering points. Bob, you uh, mentioned a minute ago that uh, you're in your second year now of supplying uh, two cattle feeders. And you mentioned uh, a plus, uh, the reaction of some of the people to whom you're supplying uh, feeder cattle. Generally, is it going well? I would say yes. Uh, the ranchers are satisfied because they know that these cattle are going, the majority of them are going into NFO feedlots. And they also know the price that they're going to receive for the cattle before they deliver their cattle. And we're spread into a lot of new areas that we weren't last year. Right at the present time, we're putting together a, a feeder movement down in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. We've had them in Florida and Georgia. We've got one coming up in Alabama. We've been in Texas and Oklahoma. And uh, all of the other states, I would say that Right at the present time, we've had feeder cattle movements in all of the major uh, cattle feeder states in the United States. Any new developments in contracts? Well, there's one principle that I would like to take a minute and talk about, Bill. And this is on the subject of contracts. We have offered contracts for future delivery in some of the western states. But while we're talking about these contracts, there's really two types, and one of them is an individual contract that is signed with a buyer and an NFO contract where a group of farmers get together and group their production and contract for delivery at a future date. Well, there's really uh, two different effects or market effects that happens when these two types of contracts are used. One is that when an individual contracts with a buyer, it has a ceiling effect on the market. And the other one is that when uh, a group of people or a group contract and it's signed with a buyer, it has a floor effect. So really, if they were both signed at the same price, the contract where the group action has been used has a much greater and upward price pressure on the market. Mm -hmm. And this is just one of the techniques that is used and can be used to have upward pressure in the market. Mm -hmm. Now these people that have used these contracts uh, can pick about a 10-day delivery date come fall and they know what price they're going to receive. And so I would say that it's a tool that's going to be used uh, quite a bit more in the future. Yeah. Bob, ranchers are saying that they need 40 cent cattle to break even, to make it. Uh, can they do this in working through NFO? Yes, he can, Bill. One thing I'd like to uh, just take a minute, and uh, I've checked a lot of records, ranchers' records in the state of Montana, Oregon, Nebraska, Missouri. And from what we can find out right at the present time, on a 400-pound choice steer calf, it will take 40 cents a pound to keep them in business. But the one thing that we have to understand, we build a price by cooperation. And the more that we sell together and work together, we can stair-step this price right up to the level that we need. And this is another truism and, and fact in NFO, that we are not just rancher-oriented. We are cattle industry-oriented. Mm -hmm. 
and we are bringing the rancher and the feeder together to accomplish a higher price level in all phases of the cattle industry so they all can survive. Mm -hmm. Bob, uh, join me, if you will, and uh, let's revisit your friend and mine, Bill Gottemuller's farm at Versailles, Ohio. Bill Gottemuller and I are standing in front of probably one of the world's best traveled plows, a contest plow. Bill, uh, you were the national plowing champion what year? In 1966, Bill, out in the state of uh, Iowa, out in your neighborhood. Yeah, and uh, this plow, of course, you took later to Rhodesia. Uh, I didn't take the whole plow to Rhodesia, but I took parts of it. Uh, the cost prohibited me of taking it. I was uh -huh. lucky enough to get myself there, being a young NFO man. Yeah. Uh, but this plow has plowed in national competition several times in the state of Minnesota, in Iowa, in Illinois, in Pennsylvania, as well as Ohio here, and several other states uh, throughout the Corn Belt. Well, now, your dad, uh, before you, uh, entered in many of these contests, did he not? That's right. Dad started out uh, way back in the years of 1935. He plowed with horses, and then uh, several years they didn't have national plowing contests. Then along about the late 1940s, they started having uh, national competition, and uh, being a plowing family, why we got right in it again, and Dad won the national championship in 1956 and 1957, and then just 10 years later, I won the national in 1966 in the same state that he won in, in Iowa. That's a real coincidence. Well, Bill, uh, how did you come out in competition in the world plowing contest in Rhodesia? Well, I didn't win it, but I come in ninth uh, out of a field of about 22 plowmen from 17 countries. Now, uh, I wasn't disappointed in the least. I uh, felt that I had done as good as I could, and uh, the closest anyone from the United States has ever gotten was eighth, so I felt pretty good about it. Well, you should have. Why is it, incidentally, that uh, United States uh, contestants in this world plowing contest have never done any better than that? Well, the main reason is you're competing with uh, plowmen from Europe, especially, and they're, they farm on a much smaller scale. They're much more skillful with uh, some of their equipment, and uh, when they farm on such a small scale, they just do a perfect job of plowing, uh, whatever they do. Yeah. They plow like that uh, all the time on their farm, which I can't afford to. I use this contest plow here for contest work, but I hook to a bigger plow when I go out to plow for corn. Well, in this day and age, on a farm the size of yours, you'd have one heck of a time getting much done with this plow, right? That's right. I'd have to do a lot of moonlighting. <laughs> yes, you would. Well, Bill, now, you have sophisticated this plow somewhat uh, for uh, contest use. Why don't you show us what, what you've done to it? and how it's better for a contest use than a stock plow. Okay, uh, I think one of the main features would be uh, right here on our levers. Uh, this uh, little roller in here uh, will roll up and down and it gives you a half a notch adjustment. It's a much finer adjustment. As well as when you get the lever all the way down, I'll move over here and show you. Uh, when I move this lever all the way down, and I can't hardly reach it from the tractor seat, I can flip this lever up like this, and it makes it much more convenient. As I work this lever up and down, you can see it works much easier, too, than the old levers did on the old plows. It took a, a man and a good-sized boy to raise mm -hmm. some of them old plows. Yeah. You know. uh, one of the other features, if you'll come over here and, and notice uh, the colders, we have uh, joiners on this plow. Uh, the purpose of this joiner here is to cut a little thin slice of the furrow off as the furrow starts to turn and it covers all your thrash. Now I do use some pieces of wire on here to drag down some of the thrash to do a better job, but those joiners there are really the little tool, it's just a simple thing, that really make a perfect job. Now of course uh, you can't always use those in corn stalks because they will plug up, but uh, in contest work we normally plow sod, uh, Bill, mm -hmm. and, uh, or stubble gun, they work yeah. real good. Now. This uh, this is something that interested me. This aids you in uh, keeping your uh, furrows straight. Would you explain uh, that? Yes, that's true. Uh, this is kind of a gauge that I devised on there, and it'll, it uh, runs right along my furrow wall, and in the black ground where my plow has a tendency to pull in, well, I can immediately notice it, and I'll make that adjustment on the hitch to allow for that. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. on light-colored ground, it, the plow has a tendency to pull out. Yeah. 
I don't know about you folks, but I've always had the notion, wrongfully so, that a plowing contest involved speed. And uh, Bill Gottemiller tells me that there is no speed involved in it whatsoever. In fact, uh, just exactly how do the contests work, Bill? Well, we have a half acre to plow. Each contestant gets a half acre. And if you use a two bottom plow, you'll get about 96 minutes to plow that half acre. And normally you can, uh, you can plow a uh, half acre easily in that time. However, this is not a speed contest and we want to do a perfect job. So we take our time. We try to do as straight a job as we can. We try to have the soil broke up as much as possible and uh, have each furrow so that you can't pick one furrow from the other. Uh, to, make it look, uh, to make it look realistic, we'd just like to have it look like if a man went in there with one enormous plow and just made one pass <laughs> yeah. and plowed the whole yeah. half acre. Uh, <clears throat> another, gotta, excuse me, go ahead. Uh, another thing that uh, uh, is kind of tricky in plowing contests, and that is your closing furrow. Uh, a lot of we have a lot of good plowmen in the country, but uh, a lot of plowmen uh, can't make a good closing furrow. And uh, I've beat a lot of men on this uh, in competition. Uh, some of them beat me too. I haven't always won, yeah. uh, but you have to be a good loser. So uh, those are some of the points, uh, Bill, in the contest. Uh, it's uh, it's just more of a sport contest. I'm not in it for the money. As a matter of fact, it gets kind of hard sometimes to travel clear across the United States to compete uh, when the, the prize money is yeah. maybe only $200 or something. <laughs> uh, it can be a loser financially, really. That's right. It's it's a real sport. Though. Well, you're going to try it again uh, soon. That's right. Uh, we're holding the national contest right here in Dark County this year. Uh, this is the first time it's ever been in this county, and I think uh, it's uh, going to be a wonderful show. Speaking of Dark County, some uh, rather famous people, you tell me, have uh, come out of this area. Who are some of them? Uh, well, uh, Annie Oakley, the famous uh, lady... Marksman was uh, born and raised just about four miles north of where I live here, and she lies in a cemetery up there now. Uh, Lowell Thomas, the famous news commentator, was born in this county, and and uh, as well as that, uh, uh, Dark County is uh, leading agriculture county in the state of Ohio. I kind of like to brag on that a little bit. You should indeed. That's, that's really something. Incidentally, when we uh, arrived here today, uh, we met uh, Bill's children. Uh, two of his daughters were dressed in special costumes, having been to nearby Greenville for uh, some sort of celebration uh, depicting and commemorating uh, an historic occasion. Uh, what historic occasion was that, uh, Bill? Uh, this is commemorating the 175th anniversary of the signing of the Greenville Treaty with the Indians. Uh, this is quite historic uh, due to the fact that after this treaty was signed, this opened up the entire Northwest Territory for the white settlers to settle. And uh, after that, it pretty well done away with the Indian Wars and so forth, and I think it's quite historic. Mm -hmm. These girls of yours are really something. Now, uh, what do they do? Uh, are they uh, drum majorettes or...? Uh... Uh, yes, they have a, a group of drum majorettes here in uh, my hometown of Versailles, and uh, they look forward to these parade events, and uh, I think they've done real well today. Yeah. Let's talk about your farming operation here, uh, Bill. Uh, this is uh, a family corporation, isn't it? That's right. Uh, my dad and I have two brothers uh, in this uh, family operation uh, with me. Uh, we've uh, recently incorporated, uh, due mainly to uh, uh, some uh, tax uh, reasons and also uh, to transfer this real estate. Uh, mm -hmm. In this part of the country, our real estate is rather high priced, and for a young farmer to come out here and buy his own farm and start out farming, it's, it's just out of the picture. Yeah. You just can't uh, borrow enough money to do this. What is your corporate name? What do you call uh, it? Gotta Miller Stock Farms Incorporated is what we go by. Yeah. How many acres do you farm here? We farm uh, 750 acres. Uh, part of it is pasture land. We raise approximately 400 acres of corn, uh, 50 acres of uh, hay and uh, some wheat and some soybeans. Yeah. Do you feed uh, most of this to your cattle? Uh, we feed all of our corn and hay. Uh, we do sell our beans and wheat as cash crop. Uh, but uh, the corn, we don't even raise enough. We have uh, a good number of cattle on feed, and we still have to buy some corn in addition to what we raise. Uh, Bill, how many head of cattle do you uh, 
fatten, feed, and sell every year? About 500 head uh, is what we uh, fatten and feed, and we have uh, 70 head of brood cows, which uh, we raise about 70 calves a year, and we put those on feed, and, and uh, we pasture the cows on corn stalks and on some of our permanent pasture that we have around. But we actually, <clears throat> in our feed lot here, uh, on dry feed, uh, we've got facilities for approximately 500 head, and that's, that's on three lots. Mm -hmm. Now, we've looked around your feedlot here, and it certainly looks great. Uh, it's fairly new, isn't it? Yes, uh, I started about 10 years ago, 1960 I started, and then I've just added on as years went along. Do you buy uh, your cattle through NFO as well as sell them through NFO? Yes, uh, this year we bought every head through NFO. Uh, last year we just got started in this feeder cattle business in this area and we bought about half of them but this year uh, we bought them all and we're really satisfied with them what do you feel some of the advantages of buying nfo <coughs> cattle are uh one of the big advantages is uh they don't uh, lay around in the uh, stockyards and the collection points long uh, they'll be brought into the collection points in kentucky or tennessee or wherever we buy them and uh, uh, immediately they'll be trucked out and there's only about a matter of 12 or 14 hours and uh, this really helps uh, you don't have the problem getting shipping fever uh, you don't they'll go on feed a lot quicker and uh, we feel that you can just about save two weeks in feeding bill you've really sophisticated your feeding setup here it's really a matter of walking out there and pushing a button isn't it uh, this is right uh, however uh, you do have some problems occasionally, and you have to be an engineer to figure out where that problem is. Uh, <laughs> is that right? Uh, sometimes uh, people think, well, farming is getting to the point where you just sit there and push buttons. Well, as long as everything works, it's all right. But uh, a lot of times on a Sunday morning when you're in a hurry to get to church or something, <laughs> then it's when the things don't work. That's and when it goes to pot. That's right. Well, I think that's true of most everything. The more sophisticated these machines become, uh, the more chance, of course, for failure and the more difficult they are to uh, to fix and repair. But uh, you have these feeding bunks out here, and uh, your silos, of course, uh, stand there, and they must be tremendous capacity silos. Uh, yes, uh, although they're making them bigger than what these are, these hold 400 ton apiece, uh, and we fill them twice a year. We fill them with corn uh, silage in the fall, and the, as soon as the first one's empty, why... We uh, fill it with ground ear corn, uh, which we have in some of our cribs. Uh, mm -hmm. We mix water with it, and then as soon as the second one is empty, we fill it with haylage, so we feed out of those silos year-round. That's great. Well, let's talk a little bit about your investment here. Uh, looking around your farm, uh, you have an excellent home. Uh, your uh, outbuildings are all in uh, first-class repair and uh, in fact, I notice you're uh, laying a foundation for a new building. What's that going to be? Uh, this is going to be a farm shop and a machine shed. Uh, we've put this uh, job off for several years, uh, mainly because we didn't feel we could afford it. Our machine just had to set outside uh, uh, and in some of the old buildings that I had, but now we feel that uh, since NFO has helped us out enough that we can afford to put up a shop and a good machine shed, and, and uh, that's what the foundation is going to be. Uh, Bill. How many uh, tractors do you have, Bill? Uh, we have six tractors. Uh, the biggest one is uh, uh, about a 90 horsepower, and they range on down. Uh, we have two tractors with manure loaders on them. Uh, uh, they just about have the manure loaders on year-round. Your manure problem is a big one, isn't it, in a feedlot situation like you have? Yes, I think this is a problem. It's an endless problem that uh, nearly every feedlot has. Uh, however, we spread all of our manure on the land. Uh, we spread it on uh, either just before we plow or on uh, uh, idle ground or something mm -hmm. like this. And uh, I think it saves us a great deal on fertilizer. What are some of the other items of equipment we've seen? Uh, well, uh, one of our most used uh, items is our uh, feed grinder, which gets used uh, twice a day, and and uh, we have uh, several big plows, and uh, and of course the full line of tillage equipment, which a man needs now to raise 400 acres of corn, and uh, uh, we have the full line of hay equipment as well as uh, insulage. We have our own uh, unit harvester. Uh, uh, which uh, we use for harvesting our grain and ensilage crops. Bill, uh, how much investment do you feel you have here in the land, your buildings, and your equipment? 
Well, in our entire operation, uh, we have uh, uh, three feed lots, and uh, all together, uh, it would run in the neighborhood of four to five hundred thousand uh, dollars. This is a great investment, and as you can see, it's more than any one man can can take yes, over. Indeed. Do you have any idea what kind of return through the years you've been getting on on the investment? Uh, it averages uh, approximately five to five and a half percent return. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, of course, that doesn't allow us much for labor. Uh, what about your education, Bill? Have you gone to college? Uh, I attended uh, some short courses in agriculture at Purdue University and also at Ohio State. Uh, however, I never felt that I could gain enough from uh, getting a degree from uh, college. Uh, but uh, since I've been a member of NFO, I joined in 1962. Uh, since that time, I feel I've... Uh, got enough education through NFO uh, that uh, I would have got through four years of college. Do you feel that NFO has helped you greatly in dollars and cents? You must feel that way. You say that you're able to build that new building out there because of NFO. Well, that's true. Uh, I can't put my finger on any particular dollar sign. Uh, now how much it has helped us, it's helped us considerably. As a matter of fact, uh, if cattle prices uh, today were like they were back in 1962 and 63, I doubt very much whether we'd uh, be feeding cattle today. As a matter of fact, I doubt whether we could we would be able to borrow enough money. We'd we'd probably been bankrupt by now. Bill, I want to wish you the very best of luck in this year's plowing contest. Well, I'll need it. Uh, I look forward to it, and I'm going to do the best I can. I have one more crack at the national competition. If I win it again, then they disqualify me. They say I've had enough, <laughs> so I'm going to give her all I got. Hope you make it. Okay. Quite a fella. Bill Gottemuller. Bob, uh, in closing today, is there anything particularly you would like to say to the farmers who are looking in? Yes, I would. When people are unaware and are not knowledgeable, of the problems and how to solve it. Someone else can be blamed for their plight. But once they understand and they know how to solve their problem, at this point, if they don't, it's their fault. An NFO's success is based on cooperation. And all I say to these people that, have, that haven't become a part of helping to solve the problem, ask your NFO neighbor and go to his meeting it will be a big help. Bob, thank you very much for being my special guest on this week's U.S. Farm Report. Well, thank you for inviting me, Bill. It's been my pleasure. My special guest this week has been Mr. Bob Mankey, who is the director of the feeder cattle division of the National Farmers Organization. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week on this station at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.